You know, we're late on this one. We announced this last year, and we expected to have this up in production by the end of the year, and we didn't. And there's a few reasons for this. Most importantly, within two months of launching the App Store, we had over 1,000 applications on the App Store. And we had over 100 million applications that had been downloaded. And a huge number of developers came to us saying how excited they were about push notifications and how they were going to use it in volumes that we hadn't considered. And so we had to completely re-architect the server infrastructure for push notifications. And that's what we've spent this last six months doing, completely re-architecting it to make it really, really scalable. And that was when we had 100 million downloads. Now we've had over 800 million downloads. So this is what we've been targeting. So now we're good to go. Now, we were asked, well, why don't you just do background processes? I mean, it's, it's easier for us to do background processes. And the answer is, it's not good for the customer for a number of reasons. One is battery life. Background processes drain your battery. They don't let your phone go to sleep when it needs to. They don't let it go to the lowest power state. And actually, we, we've been testing this. We've been running some background processes on some other phones. And I remember one test in particular. We took a popular instant messaging client, and we ran it on a Windows mobile phone, on an Android phone, and on a BlackBerry. Didn't send or receive any instant messages, just turned the app on so it would run in the background. And we measured the standby time, right? so the battery life as measured by standby time. And in all cases, the standby time dropped by 80% or more, just by having that background process on. Now, anything you're going to do is going to take some battery life. Even push notifications take some. So we took a third-party push notification instant messaging application, ran it on iPhone 3.0, and that battery life, the standby, only decreased by 23%. So it's a much better model for battery life. Next, performance. By the very nature, a background process is chewing up CPU cycles. And so it's slowing down that foreground application that you want to be snappy. So because of that, we are doing push notifications, and we're really excited about it. And we've been working with third-party developers already, and they are thrilled with what we can offer. Here's how it works. Let's say you have an instant messaging application. And while it's running, it's connected to your server. So if you want to send a notification up there, just talk right to your application. But when you quit the application, you no longer have this connection open. That's where the Apple push notification service comes into play. It has a persistent connection open to the phone. And so this third-party server just passes its notifications through the Apple push notification server. There are three types of notifications you can push. One is a badge, so you can badge how many items are waiting for the user. You can also badge audio alerts. And this can be whatever sound you want for your application. It's customizable for your application. You can also send text alerts. Text alerts appear the same way that SMSs appear. And you can even add a button where if the user taps on that button, they'll launch right into your application. Now, of course, the reason we're doing these, and the nice part about it, is it scales. It scales to all of these third-party services that want to take advantage of it. And we're really excited about that. So push notifications. It is a unified, generic push notification service for all developers. It preserves your battery life. It maintains the performance of your phone. And we've optimized it for mobile networks. Now, as Josh said earlier, we're in over 80 countries around the world this week. And that's with over 25 carriers. And every carrier has slightly different configurations of their networks. So we're doing all the hard work for you of making sure that we keep that persistent connection open to the phone so you don't have to. And it is now really scalable, and we're ready to go. So these are only a few of the more than 1,000 APIs that make up the SDK in iPhone 3.0. 
Let me touch on just a few more of these. Uh, In-app email. We now have a sheet, an email sheet, that you can use right from your application so you don't have to leave it to send an email. Proximity sensor is now a public API. This is a big one, iPod library access. Developers can now access, browse, and play music right out of the built-in iPod library on the phone. Uh, streaming audio and video. We're introducing a new standard for streaming audio and video over HTTP, so it even goes through firewalls. Make the Shake API public, so you can use shaking. Uh, we've made data detectors and core data we've added. An in-game voice. We've even, if you have a, a game that plays over Wi-Fi, we have built-in voice chat APIs you can use to add voice into your game. So again, just a few of the over 1,000 APIs we're adding for developers. This is a big update for the iPhone SDK. Now, a couple weeks ago, we called up a few developers and asked them to come in and get a sneak peek at the iPhone 3.0 SDK and see what they could do in only two weeks. And what they've done has just blown me away. So I'd like to bring them up here, a few of them, to show you and tell you what they've accomplished with iPhone 3.0. We have some phones here that are tethered, so they can have their demos on it, all connected up to the screen. And they'll go ahead and give you some demos. Let's start with Mebo. With over 45 million people sending over 5 billion messages a month, Mebo is one of the fastest growing social websites out there. And now, they're moving it native on the iPhone. To talk you through their experiences, I'd like to invite up Seth 